Let's kick off. So, a little bit of my, my background. Um, I started as a software engineer. Uh, that's my background. I've always been writing software. Started right at the front end, writing uh, JavaScript code. Started writing back end code. Kind of fell into the space of needing to build infrastructure. Um, and then along that journey, started by trying to write good docs that people can follow and you know, iterate and make sure you get all the things fixed so that at least it's documented and people can build the same stuff over and over. And then I kind of fell into the infrastructure as code space and started exploring, I think my first tool was Ansible. Um, so uh, automating uh, VM setup, things like that. And then getting into the cloud, started initially, I think it was using a serverless framework um, and then getting into cloud formation. And then I kind of ended up in a place where I heard about Pulumi and infrastructure as code, and it kind of just clicked for me. Uh, so the whole software development experience of being able to write code, which describes your final state of uh, what you're wanting to deploy, and then being able to iterate on that, make changes, and then reconcile that state. So hopefully that's probably the experience that a lot of us have had here. Um, and then after I did that for a few years, I ended up in a job at working at Pulumi, at which point I discovered there were so many things I didn't know that was actually going on behind the scenes. So having used the tool for a good few years myself and diagnosing all kinds of issues, I still found that after actually getting into the depths of uh, how, Pulumi, uh, how Pulumi providers work, it actually gave me a whole new understanding and ability to diagnose the interesting <laughs> uh, behaviours that you sometimes get. Uh, which are a result of complex systems. So that's kind of what I'm wanting to talk about today, is building providers. We're talking about both Open Tofu and uh, Pulumi, because we're focusing on open source. We're all about open source here. Um, so I want to hopefully uh, send you away with a concrete understanding of what providers are in Open Tofu and Pulumi, um, how having an awareness of how they actually work internally, um, and then, oh, I've just remembered I need to start my timer. And then also uh, having a good starting point to know where to start writing providers or how they're constructed at a practical code level. So I'm wanting to get into some practical code and we'll actually look at some Go code today. Um, hands up here, who's familiar with Go code? Most people, about half and half. Okay, so I'll try and explain the syntax as well uh, a bit. Um, so let's kick off and great so yeah a uh, quick um, disclaimer 90% of the work I do is on uh, Pulumi so that is my area of deep expertise but most of the concepts that I'm going to be talking about today apply to both Pulumi and Open Tofu but there are a few subtle variations so I will try to call out those variations uh, where I can, but there might also be a few that slipped through because I don't know everything on the open tofu side. Um, so I'll do my best, um, but if you spot something, feel free to call it out and I'll, uh, I'll pull that in as well. So, um, yeah, so what my day-to-day -day job is, I actually work on the providers team. Uh, so I'm an open source engineer and I'm working on the big cloud providers. So AWS, Azure, a little bit of GCP and a bit of Kubernetes as well. So I help maintain them, get the releases out, keep it all fresh. So it's kind of matching what the clouds can actually do. So let's kick off with what is a provider? Um, so you might have heard the word floating around but not know exactly what it means. It's quite an abstract term. So I think the definition I quite like for what a provider is, it's the name given to a plugin for Open Tofu and uh, Pulumi infrastructure as code tools, which enable them to bring external systems under declarative control. So it's a plugin. Uh, at the core of it, they are just binaries, which you ship, um, and then you, the tool themselves is running that binary in order to be able to interact with those external systems. So the most common examples of them and probably what most people are using them for is accessing clouds, building cloud infrastructure in code. But there's a few other things that we can do as well using them, and this uh, helps us dig into what a provider is at the core and what other interesting use cases we can have for them too. 
So beyond the standard cloud models that we can uh, use, um, this is an interesting uh, provider that we use a lot uh, at uh, Plumi itself as well, the GitHub provider. So you can use a provider as well as building cloud resources, anything with an API, basically you can wire up to a uh, provider. So there's some examples, there's, diff there's 70 different resources just in the GitHub provider. You can create a new repo, you can set up tag protection, you can set up teams and membership and permissions and branch protections, and you can declare all those things in code. So pretty much anything that's got an API where you can say, These are, this is the things I want to go and create, and that API can do creates and deletes and ideally updates as well, um, then you can manage it using code. Um, so, yeah, that's a good first example. Basically, anything with an API we can bring in as a provider. Probably makes sense. Next interesting one I want to look at is uh, the Plumi command provider. Um, I don't know if there's an exact equivalent to this on the open tofu side, um, but the core idea here is where you can construct a provider on the fly uh, based on a set of um, a set of different commands. So you fill in what you want uh, the uh, provider to do for you at certain different lifecycle events. So you can set up a create command. So when I go and create this resource, this is the command I want you to go and run. And then you can add other commands here for update, delete, and read, which allows you to model the lifecycle of a resource. So this is kind of quite a neat way of being able to bring something that's not got a provider necessarily, uh, under under control. So actually it's quite neat here to be able to shell out to other command line tools. So if a, a, if a service has a command line tool but doesn't yet have a provider, this is quite a nice little stop gap where you can actually just call in uh, without having to author an entire provider. Um, another interesting aspect to this, um, something that's added more recently, is the idea of being able to invoke functions and then grab assets. So when you're working with applications, it may well be that the application is not necessarily built in the same language, in the same ecosystem tools as your infrastructure. And actually it might be a different team who focuses on the infrastructure, a different team that focuses on the application. So what we're actually doing here is saying, so this is a invoke or in uh, OpenTofu, this would be known as a data source. So it's essentially a data source which is saying in order to go and retrieve this data, we are going to go and run this command. But as well as returning the output, we can also actually point it at some paths and say, go and then capture these paths after we've run this command. And this is a really neat way of basically being able to do things like run a build to go and build your assets to deploy into an S3 bucket or to be able to push into a Lambda function. So you can go and write your uh, infrastructure in TypeScript, say, or Python, and then have your Lambda being built in Go, and then use this to go grab the binary and then actually upload it into there. So this is kind of an interesting example because it's not your typical use case of a cloud service um, that you're interacting with. Basically, you can interact with pretty much anything. So to take this uh, another step further, uh, you've got the random provider. This is in both uh, Plumi and Open, uh, Open Tofu. This is available, um, and this is a provider which doesn't connect to anything at all. And so all it actually has at the core of it is a little bit of state, which is the random seed. So when you initialize a new resource, um, you are giving it the initial seed. So on the create, a seed is assigned, and then on a update, it would also then regenerate a seed. But assuming you don't update the actual resource itself, the seed will stay the same, at which point all of the outputs that you get from that resource stay consistent. So the main issue here is randomness in both OpenTofu and Plumi uh, is not great <laughs> when you're wanting to know what happens. And so this is a way of safely introducing randomness. If you've built uh, much at all, you'll probably have come across this for various use cases. So this is interesting because at the core of this provider, we're not going out to anything external, but we've got two things. We've got Number one, uh, we have inputs, and then number two, we've got state, and the state also then serves as the outputs which you then generate. So that is really starting to get to the crux of what a provider is, its inputs and its state. So to take it a stage further, 
a nice little demo that someone hacked together was a Wordle provider. <laughs> Basically anything which has a set of inputs that you can give and then some state that it provides can be turned into a provider. So in this provider, you've got uh, your Wordle provider and your input here is the word that you're guessing. And then you run your deployment and it will go and make that, that guess. And then we store that into the state here as your next guess along and you can see where you've got up to and then you can change your word, redeploy, but ultimately it's just input and state. So that is the core of kind of what a provider is. So um, let's move on to actually how providers work. So the, uh, what we'll do first is have a quick look at the architecture and actually how the different components are spun up and are connected together. So looking first at OpenTofu, um, there are, these are very similar between the two platforms, but um, there's some subtle differences. We'll talk through them separately. When you run an OpenTofu command, um, like apply, then uh, you're starting initially the CLI tool, which has the engine in it. That's going to evaluate your HTL, and then the engine itself is going to work out what it's going to need to do. So from reading the HCL, the first thing it's going to work out is what are the providers that it needs to work with. So behind the scenes, it's then going to take that provider definition and go off to the registry and download the provider for you. Um, and then once the provider's downloaded, the next thing it's going to do, that is just a binary, it's going to start up that binary. So it's a console application, the engine itself is going to start that binary, it passes some information across. Once that binary is started, um, it's then going to establish a gRPC connection between the engine and the plugin. And so all other operations then across gRPC. Also interesting here that with this kind of binary model, uh, providers are run and there's a whole separate process instance run for each different configuration. So if you have two configurations of the same provider, there'll be two binaries running. Um, and that's just how the isolation of configuration is managed within both OpenTofu and Plumi. And then we've got our gRPC methods. So the initial methods that are going to be run, there's two. There's validate provider config, which gives an opportunity to make sure that provider config matches the schema, the values are valid, and then we'll actually do the real configure. And that will talk to whatever provider you're working with. Um, so there's a few different uh, workflows. So if you're running a validate, there's an example of some of the uh, methods that you'll be running there across the GRPC. You'd be seeing validate provider config, validate resource configs for each of your resources, validate data resource config um, for each of your, uh, data, that should be data source, I think. No, I think it's actually called data resource, which is slightly confusing. So at the GRPC level, there is some slightly different naming. And then on a plan, you'd be running those same validate steps, but then also configuring the provider and actually doing the real configure, then also doing the real reads and doing the real plan changes. And then on the apply, you'd be doing all of that again with the actual apply at the end. So that's what's actually going on behind the scenes is the gRPC methods backwards and forwards. So it's kind of interesting. It's good to know that these things are happening, but most of the time we don't actually need to look into this in too much detail. So super quickly again, Plumi is very similar. You've got the engine, except instead of just evaluating a kind of template, it's actually going to start up a language server to run your application. It runs your program that you've uh, configured it with, and then the program actually has a gRPC connection back to the engine, at which point it sends the register resource request saying, this is the state I want this resource to be in. And some of those resources are themselves providers. And again, it's got the same mechanism there to then go and discover the providers, download them, then it starts up the binary and then connects over gRPC, and then everything else is done over gRPC. So the methods on the gRPC are slightly different, but they're kind of equivalent. So there's actually three steps on doing the initial configure. So you've got a check config, which is just validating. Then you've got a diff config, which is then looking for things like, is there a uh, change within this, which is actually going to cause a replacement? So for example, have you just changed the region on your AWS provider? At which point you can't just leave the resources as they are, we're gonna to have to go and recreate them. So we can then force recreation of all of the uh, resources within that provider. And then you've got the final step of actually doing the configure, where we're going to then commit that configuration into that process instance. Um, then similarly for resources, it follows the same uh, pattern of methods, first check and then diff, 
and then you've got your actual operations at the end. You've got your create, your update, and your delete. And then that's a nice little graph of all the different orders in which things can be called in for specifically for Plumi providers. So if you're going down the read path, it's just calling into the read. If you're going into import, it's doing some read and check and diffing. If you're going into manage, then it's going to call check and then either do a create if it's something new or if it, you've got something existing, then we're going to go down the call diff. So these are all of the, the actual core methods that get called within the provider in different orders for different scenarios. So as I said, fortunately, we don't actually have to worry about these too much. Um, but these things can be super useful when you get into debugging and trying to work out what's happened in what order. You can enable the verbose logs and see all of this stuff going through in real time and then be able to work out, okay, which stage is this actually failing at? So that's why I'm kind of giving you this background. It's hopefully just giving you the tools. Um, so I imagine, you know, I was, I'm trying to think like uh, the different scenarios that pe people would want to write a provider. Um, so I think Maybe there's some people here who actually build their own APIs, their own SaaS products, and are interested in shipping providers. Um, I think there's probably more of us here who are actually the consumers and we're using providers. And so having a good understanding of like what's actually going on behind the scenes for when stuff goes wrong, but also hopefully being able to narrow it down and actually give you the tools to say, work out what's going wrong, be able to file better tickets, and then maybe even contribute back fixes. So hopefully I can take you along that journey a little bit uh, today. So let's get into actually what it takes to write a provider. So currently, there's probably four main ways of writing a provider that you'd see commonly out in the wild. So on the open tofu side, open tofu doesn't yet have their own specific way of authoring providers. Um, so we're going to be looking specifically at the Terraform, uh, the Terraform libraries for doing this. However, they are both still MPL v2 licensed. They are properly open source. Uh, and I imagine if that changes, then Open Tofu are going to tackle that as well. So on the Open Tofu side, you've got the the, uh, the way that most providers are probably written right now, if you go and have a look at the code, is going to be using the Terraform plugin SDK slash V2. There's a V1, which is pretty much unused, I think, now. I don't, I'm not aware of that many uh, providers still using them. Um, but V2 is still heavily used. But this is now marked as legacy. Um, so you may well come across lots of code bases which are still using it. Um, but for today, we're going to skip over this one and rather look at the future and look at how things are being built. So the second option is the Terraform plugin framework. Uh, so we refer to this as the TFPF. Um, and this is what uh, a lot of the, uh, the providers are starting to migrate to. So even the main uh, AWS provider is now starting to write new resources in the TFPF. Um, and they're doing that so you can actually use some of these things side by side using things called muxers. And there's various different muxers. And I had a question before coming up here whether we'll be able to get onto muxers. I don't think we're going to be able to cover that in depth, but the idea is you can essentially have two separate providers within the same library and then use a muxer to say combine this one and this one. And then you get one unified provider which covers all of the things. And this is also the case, so you can do that at the Terraform level. Uh, there's also a uh, Pulumi Muxer as well, so you can do that on that side. So on the Pulumi side, there's two main routes. So the most common route, I would say 90% of providers that you'll come across go down the bridged route. And this is a framework which allows you to take the Go library that's being used to build either a Terraform plugin SDK uh, provider or a Terraform plugin framework provider and bring in that library and then rebuild it as a new binary which is then a Plumi provider. So that is widely used and uh, most Plumi providers that you'll probably interact with are going to be using that. Um, there is also another interesting uh, library which is still in preview um, which we'll have a look at, which is the Plumi Go provider, which is a way of writing native um, providers in Go, which works quite nicely. I would say, though, if you're on the side of wanting to actually author providers, I think the 
process of actually using something like the TFPF um, and then bridging, it makes a lot of sense. So if you're a kind of a, a SaaS author, this gives you the widest access. So you get your kind of main framework, you get access to both of the ecosystems, and there's not that much that's actually involved in doing the bridging process. So it's, it's a pretty good setup. There is also have included for completeness, the Go gRPC interface. So if you happen to go and look at the Plumi native providers, uh, that we actually author, so we've got uh, native providers for uh, AWS, um, for Azure, and Docker. Uh, actually, the Docker one doesn't use this anymore. We've migrated off of it. But you'll actually see we, we write a lot of our own providers against the raw uh, gRPC interface still, just for legacy reasons. So if you come across that, sometimes there just isn't a provider, and we just go straight to metal. So, But we're not going to look at that today. OK, so let's get into. Um, some practical code and what this actually looks like. Actually, I'll just pause. Is there any kind of questions? Is this making sense so far? Give me a nod. Yep, great. So Terraform provider framework. Let's look at some demos. Right, first off, is that nice and visible to everyone? Is that big enough? Yep. OK, so we're going to have a look at this open tofu. So the best starting point for writing uh, a new provider on the TFPF is the boilerplate. So this is exactly what I've got here. I've literally just taken the provider scaffolding and cloned it, and then done a quick bit of renaming. And I am calling this the, what did I call it? Uh, the Platopia provider. So there's a few bits you need to go in, do some find and replace. Um, but our main entry point, as I was saying, this is just console application. So we have a main.go. This is the first thing that Go will run when it starts the application. And there's very little boilerplate here. We're parsing one Boolean flag for debug, which we then just pass through to the, ser uh, to the serve options. Uh, we have an address for where this is actually uh, hosted from. So this would normally be your registry address. Um, which the, as uh, the Open to uh, Tofu uh, person was talking about yesterday, um, there is now a separate registry for Open Tofu. And then we just call into this provider.serve method. But uh, the one other key thing that we need to customize here is the constructor we're calling. So uh, provider.serve takes a function which returns a provider. So we're going to have a look at this next. So let's dig down into the provider. What code is going on here? So there's our constructor. It's just a new method, passing in the version. And in Go, to create a class, you just have a struct, and then you attach methods to a struct. That's all that is going on. So we've created this new struct here called the Platopia provider. Let's go and have a look at that. It's just at the top of the file. And this just has one property on it, which is the version. So the provider itself doesn't have that much going on. We've um, got this little line here, which is a bit magical if you've not read much Go before. Essentially, what this is saying is I want to implement the interface provider.provider .provider for the class plateau pr provider. And that will throw an error if we get something wrong or are missing a method. So we're going to then uh, implement the method, uh, implement the interface via adding four methods. Um, we're going to add, there's kind of two groups of methods. Uh, there is, sorry, three, no, there's a couple more methods. Um, so there's two halves of the methods that we're doing work with. So one thing is for setting up the configuration, and then the second half is then actually serving up what this provider can do, so the resources and data sources. So in terms of configuration, the first bit is the static configuration, the metadata. So this is the name of the provider and the version, nothing else to it. Next bit is the schema. So in the Terraform plugin framework, when you're thinking about um, uh, providers in OpenTofu, you do generally have one big schema. However, the plugin framework allows you to break it apart and build it up piece by piece. So the provider itself is only serving up, it's only actually defining the schema for it for the provider level configuration. We don't have to worry about the schema for all of the resources all in one place. We don't have to build that together. So the schema that we're going to include here is just an endpoint, and that is the configuration for the provider. So we've just got one optional uh, method here. 
Then we've got the actual configuration, uh, the actual configure method, which is going to then uh, be run at runtime to set up our object with any information that we need. So this is called um, automatically uh, by the, the plugin framework and we get given a request object and a response object. Um, these are untyped initially and so we've got this nice little helper here which lets us unpack the untyped bag of values into a concrete data structure. So our data structure here is this value and is this class name. And let's go and have a look at that. It says just up here. So it's just another struct. It's just some bits of data. And we've got some little Go attributes on here so it knows the mapping between the names. So what's the name actually in the schema going to be and what's the property we're going to go and, go and unpack it into. So this is a pattern that we'll see a fair bit. We do this, uh, create the data object, and then we're going to do the unpack, and then we automatically just take any errors that happens during that deserialization and push them into the diagnostics. Uh, so once we've got that step and we've uh, checked there isn't an error, we're going to go down. We can then use the data from there to set something up. So we're not actually using anything right now, but we could do data dot, and we've got the endpoint in there. So I'm not even putting this on, but uh, onto kind of any contextual information. So here we're just setting up a client. Um, so one one thing that uh, configuration need, uh, the configure method needs to do is set up everything that we need to then, when we're working with resources or data sources, be able to um, go and interact with the external service. So that all happens in this configure phase. So in order to pass information between the uh, configure that's happening here and the resources and data sources, uh, we pass it across using two little uh, bags of untyped information, which is data source data and the resource data. And that will then be made available when you're writing a resource or a data source. So that is then the configuration phase done. And the final thing that the provider needs to do is then say what are the resources and data sources that I want to provide. So let's just look down the, we're just going to cover resources today, we're not going to go into data sources, they're kind of similar in the way you write them, a little bit simpler generally. Um, so let's look at the resource here, we're calling a, con well we're passing a constructor in uh, for our example resource. So we're just uh, stepping down here into the example resource. And this, again, follows a very similar pattern to the, provi uh, the provider level uh, class that we're setting up. So we're instantiating this new struct for our class called example resource. Example resource uh, is defined just below, and that is going to need access to the HTTP client. So how do we get access to that HTTP client? That's where the untyped property bag comes in. Um, we can then unpack it. So that happens during our configure down here. So that's where that is going to come from data, and then we can use some casting to unpack the data, assign it to the class, and then we can reuse that uh, client for subsequent um, operations. So we skipped over a little bit there. Again, we've got the same static metadata, essentially what is the name of the resource that we want to define and then what is the schema so what's the properties um, one interesting thing to note here is that uh, what I was saying about you have inputs and you have state these are kind of described together in one place and essentially what is inputable and what is purely state is kind of inferred from the options you can set so we're just doing three separate uh, properties here we've got an identifier a property which can be defaulted uh, to some value and also a configurable, a, just a nice, easy input value. So the assumption within a uh, open tofu provider is that any input will also form the state, but then you can also have additional state which you can calculate. So whether that's a return from the service or something that you want to uh, just populate yourself, you can just calculate it from another field. Uh, that's what's called a computed value. 
So where you set computer to true, that's saying, I will fill in this value, and this is going to then be available in state and as an output. Uh, you've also got some interesting things like plan modifiers, which lets you customize the behavior a little bit further. So on the identifier, we're going to use a plan modifier to say, actually, for subsequent operations after the create, um, if an identifier isn't passed back, just go and use the previous identifier. The identifier hasn't changed. Maybe the identifier is only ever returned on the initial create. Let's just fill it in back from the state. So we don't have to remember to do that every time we actually implement an update function or something like that. We can just use the plan modifier. So then we've covered off the uh, configure. We're just going to go grab the HTTP client um, and then we are ready to actually look at our create methods. Uh, our create, then we've got an update and a delete, and I believe there's, oh, there's the reader, skipped over it. So these, again, all follow a very standard pattern. So hopefully this will start becoming familiar. We're going to have a resource model, which is a nice little struct, which matches the schema. And it has the same uh, attributes on it for unpacking the uh, untyped data into this nice type struct. So that's our data. We're then going to call this plan.get to unpack it for us into that struct, add any errors, exit if there's an error, and then we can use that uh, data here. So we can just go into data and then we've got our properties. Um, so here we're using the, we're actually going to set uh, data on this as well. So this is our state model. Um, so as well as get unpacking the inputs into this uh, struct, we can then set any values on this that we want to then persist in state at the end of the operation. And then to do the actual persist, that's where we call into the response, and we're going to call set, and that's going to then serialize that struct back into the untyped data to be persisted. And that's basically the same pattern for the read. We do the get, we unpack it, do some operations to fetch the data, and then call the set at the end. Update, exactly the same thing. Delete is very slightly different in that you unpack the request, but there is no response because the thing is gone unless there's an error. So if there is no error, you just exit. That's it. So that is a very brief summary of what a resource looks like. I'm going to move swiftly on. This is just a very brief tour. Uh, I'd love to go into more detail on this, um, but we're going to have a quick look now at now we've got this library, how do we bridge it and then turn it into a Pulumi provider? So this is this uh, open tofu provider has a go mod and it's got a module up here. There it is, open tofu provider Platopia. So in order to bridge this, we're going to reference this go module. Now I'm working locally. So uh, this is the folder alongside for the Pulumi uh, bridge uh, project. And then in here, we have a few different modules. So we have a separate module for the provider, which is the binary we're going to create. So in here, I've just set this up for the demo um, with a require here of our Platopia provider. And then I'm just using a local replace to say, it's OK, it's just actually over here in this local, um, this local folder. So that's the first thing we do. Again, this is all from a template. Um, so if we look at the readme, you can see this is just the boilerplate. Um, when you get started with this boilerplate, it's got some nice little instructions, but basically there's one magic command here, which is make prepare and then put the name in, put the repository in, and it does all the final places for you, and you should be good to start coding. Once you've done that, the first thing you need to do is go and reference the provider that you're wanting to consume. So in our provider package, we've got our go mod, which we've added that to already. And so then we go into our resources.go and we go and add a reference to that. And we typically just call this upstream. So that's the upstream provider we're gonna pull in and then consume. And then there's one place we need to use this upstream provider, which is instantiating the provider, passing it in the version to use. Uh, and then we wrap it in this shim provider. And this thing just does a whole load of magic behind the scenes to convert it into a Plumi provider. Pass that in, um, and that's basically it. And then once we've done that, I'm actually going to hopefully get this to build. I'm gonna run make build, and what we're gonna see is 
into the uh, command directory. So we've got two binaries that we create here. One's tfgen, which is a utility which lets us generate the schema. So in Plumi, we uh, actually have a separate JSON file that we produce, which describes the full schema, and then that can be consumed in various different places. Uh, and also the resource itself, which is the binary that we're going to stand up and run, um, which then has, oh, I forgot to delete these bits in the demo. Um, so let's just delete them now. And then this should also just be completely empty initially. There we go. Right, so when we run make build, it's going to fill in for us a bunch of metadata. Uh, this is just mapping information for making sure that we're uh, able to access the names in various different programming languages that Plume makes it available to. We're also going to generate out the SDKs for each different language that we're supporting. So hopefully this is going to work. And then we're also going to build out the binaries into the bin directory down here. There we go, we've spat out some metadata about how we're mapping di between different names. There's the resource name uh, in OpenTofu, and then this is the resource name in um, Plumi. And so this metadata allows us to track as things change um, and handle things like renaming of resources, renaming of properties within resources, changing of multiplicity of resource properties, things like that. Um, then we've got our schema spat out, which describes all the different things we support. Uh, there's our resources. Again, this is kind of all just inferred automatically from the uh, provider library that you're referencing. And then we've also got built here all of our SDKs. We've got a .NET SDK with our example resource in it, uh, pointing at the token. And then you've got nicely, strongly typed uh, properties for each of the outputs. And then you've got a separate uh, inputs object for the args. Uh, you've got the same for Go, Node.js, Python. But we're going to move swiftly on. I want, there's one other uh, framework that I wanted to cover, which is the uh, native Plumi provider. So, uh, so here it is here. And what is involved in writing a native provider? This looks kind of similar to the plugin framework. Um, so. For a Plumi native provider, um, where we start, again, it's just a console app. So at the core of it, it's a main function. This is where we're coming in, and we're just going to delegate off to, so we're going to call the function to then go and start the provider up and just pass in the configuration we need. So the subtle difference between this and the Terraform plugin framework is that this relies quite heavily on generics. So we get uh, some of the unpacking of the um, the untyped data into typed uh, structs uh, done for us. So when we create the provider configuration, we're going to infer firstly the configuration from a configuration class that we've defined. So these square brackets are the generic parameters um, in Go. And then uh, we've got the resources, which uh, then infers the resource shape from the class which is going to handle the operations, then the args, which is the inputs, and then you've got the state object. So similar to uh, plugin framework, we're going to create structs, we're going to add little attributes to these so it knows how to deserialize it. Um, same for the state, which is going to inherit all of the inputs and say every input we're just going to make into state as well. And then we can add a create method here. And the create method just takes the input ready typed in the correct um, type that we want and then outputs the state in the typed object and then from here we can uh, use this helper method to unpack the configuration and then get the state we create the new state that we want construct it from the input and then at the end of the function if everything's gone right we're just going to return we've also got some other interesting properties here like preview so you can actually affect the behavior and say when we're in preview mode this is the copath we're going to follow and actually we're just going to return out early potentially um, and then when you do the real deployment then there's some additional uh, work we can do and similarly config works the same it's a struct and then we've got these attributes where there's more information that we need to provide that goes beyond just the attributes we can also add this annotate method which will then be called to add some additional information like documentation, default values, things like that. 
Um, so super quickly, I'm aware we are running low on time. So I'm just gonna jump up into Plumi resource. Just gonna do a go install, put that in my bin and just wanna show you this actually up and running. Actually, we don't have to do that. Let's just do it. Uh, let's run this in debug mode. It's probably more interesting. So let's launch, I believe that's set to the right one. So we're gonna start up our provider here. Oh, yep, it's starting there. It's going to call into our main method. Um, so this is an interesting thing when you're developing a, re a uh, provider. We can actually run it in debug mode. As we can see there, when we start up the provider for binary, it's going to print out a port number, and this is how the connection happens behind the scenes. So we're going to seeing the, the practical outworking of the theory we were looking at earlier. So then if we uh, look at this example here, we're just going to call in and create this resource just using a very simple YAML program. So if we go into our... Um, uh, CLI here will go up and into the example and then I'm going to use a debug command so plumi plumi debug pr uh, actually I think I've probably already got this yes debug providers and then for the Platopia native provider I'm going to specify the port number and then we're going to run plumi up and so as we run that hopefully we're going to hit some breakpoints there we go. So instead of the engine starting the provider up, this is a special kind of authoring method that you can use to start the provider yourself, and then the engine will just attach over it to it instead. And then we can step through the create method here, see what's going on. There we go. So we're actually in the uh, preview at the moment. So that's uh, going down the early escape route there. Got our preview. We can see the outputs. And then we can do the actual deployment. And it's going to call the same method again, but this time preview is going to be set to false. Um, so we can see uh, the configuration that was passed in, which is just the default configuration. And then we've got our state, which includes our input here. So I've got a name Dan, and then we can step through and see it's going to set the message on here and finish up. So that is, it's a small toy example, but hopefully it gives you a practical feel for what this is actually doing in the background in terms of running the engine and then connecting across via gRPC and then actually using the framework. That is a very brief tour around the, um, the different frameworks. So right, I'm just going to skip over all that because we just did it more practically. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about is do we actually have to write providers? So there's a lot of Go code here and there's a lot of providers that we maintain. So can't we just like infer this from somewhere else? Like we've got specifications and the answer is yes-ish, maybe. Um, so we do this a little bit. Um, in Plumi, we have a few native providers and this is the approach that we're kind of really pushing down to see if we can make it work. So for, I think Azure is the best example of this. So um, Azure details all of their endpoints in OpenAPI, um, and there's something like 11,000 specification documents that they have in a Git repo. We consume that, and then we can automatically build the resources from that. So rather than writing Go code, what you're doing is you're using uh, code to describe the, um, the overall ways to understand the shape of the APIs and then turn that into resources. However, it's not as straightforward as it seems. Um, so OpenAPI fundamentally isn't describing resources. It's designed to describe any potential HTTP API that anyone can build. So that's all kinds of weird and wonderful things. And it's not always obvious how to uh, understand the semantics of the API designer and turn it into something that's then consumable as a resource which has standard create methods, update methods and delete methods. Like people could just be using posts for everything. It's a post for a create and a post for an update, post for a delete, at which point then it's very hard to understand those semantics in a very general way. So this is where OpenAPI currently falls down. Fortunately for Azure, they are very rigid on how their APIs are structured, so we're able to actually uh, say these are the rules for if it's an Azure open API spec, then we can actually consume this. Also, they've got a few additional um, Microsoft specific annotations, which are also added into the spec that we can utilize. So this is, that's the, that's the one route. There is also another interesting route that's um, what AWS is looking at at the moment with their cloud control. So uh, has anyone heard of cloud control here? 
Okay, not, okay, so not many people. So cloud control is something new that's coming from AWS. This is essentially an unboxing of the individual resource uh, lifecycle methods of cloud formation. So instead of having cloud formation templates where you define the things you want, and then behind the scenes, the cloud formation engine will go and make the changes for you, work out what it needs to delete or create or update. This allows you to say for this specific resource, this is the uh, create operation I want to do, go and do a create. So it's got one generic, very simple API, which has one method for doing a create, one method update, uh, delete, etc. And all you do is change the data and you say in the data, what is the resource type that I'm wanting to operate on? At which point you just have specifications for describing the individual resources. So this is kind of turning things on its head. And this is very interesting. And, it, and this is what we use for Plumi as AWS native and it is very successful in building a very simple provider which actually gives the full access to everything the cloud service supports. So one minute left, I think. Uh, so my future bets for say the next three to five years, I think we're kind of already seeing this, but cloud providers are tending to actually write their own providers. I think we're seeing decentralization of this. And I think we're in a really good place where we're seeing diversification of the provider ecosystem. I think there's more and more tools trying to hook into this. And so, um, yeah, I think this is a healthy way that things are gonna to continue to grow. But I think also there needs to be more of a drive towards standardization. Essentially where we're at right now is we have informal standardization, which has kind of evolved from the natural uh, prevalence of uh, the Terraform providers. And so the question is, what does the future look like? Uh, whether it's going to be open API or some other uh, spec to come is yet to be seen, though my bet is probably on B, hopefully in the future. So yes, I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.